What is up, Mets fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Mets Up Podcast. We teased it last week, and we're excited to bring back Trevor May on the Mets Up Podcast. Second time guest here. Uh, love to always have you back. Trevor, how are you doing? What's going on? I am uh, doing well. Not much. Um, tweeted this out last night. I don't know if you saw it, but I uh, came to the realization recently that I would have just arrived at spring training uh, probably in the last day or two, uh, especially if I was in Arizona because we road tripped down last year, and so that's what we would have done. So on Sunday... Uh, my wife Kate was like, "Is is today the day we would have like gotten there?" I was like, "I think we've been the second day of the trip, but yeah, Monday yesterday would have been the day we arrived." So, uh, it's all kind of real now, which is it's weird, mixed feelings, but I'll be honest, uh, feels better. It feels better than it feels bad. If that makes sense, it feels good more than it feels bad. So otherwise, day before you made the pie, so definitely some yeah. new beginnings there. Lattice is crust. Yep, yeah, uh, there's only one piece left, so. And my wife's not eating pie right now. So if that puts it into perspective uh, how good it is, it was very, very good. Uh, I, I can't wait to keep exploring pie. So you brought up uh, getting ready for spring training and, you know, this would be the time when you go down. Are, are you starting to miss it yet or has that not sunk in? Uh, it, it hasn't sunk in. Uh, I, and I don't, I don't anticipate, um, I anticipate like, you know, watching baseball, like, being like, oh, you got to go like, why would you go there with that? Or, or you know, it's a young guy. I'm like, I could have told him that, you know, like I could have a conversation with him after this. Like That's what I think it will become coming from as opposed to like really feeling the itch to like be the guy or or going because that's that's I loved it. I love playing. Um, but I I'm like I, I I had a I always had mixed feelings about the start of the season, which is rare. Um, I, I couldn't really uh, ha find anyone else honestly, that, that I played with that felt, uh, maybe as strongly where moving was tough. Usually I was like at home, like making things that I like to make, especially like YouTube videos and stuff is like things I really wanted to explore. And I saw that as ending and that was always kind of like sad. Um, and then there's, I hate moving the, all of the stuff that goes along with having to like plan and move and deal with, you know, uh, new landlords. And like, you go from not having a landlord to having a landlord again, like a bunch of stuff that's kind of annoying, uh, that just kind of piles up. So I get a little, I get a little depression before I leave just because there's a lot to do. But then once I get down there, like two days in and like the day start get going, then it, it was, I'm, I've switched, you know, I switched my mindset a little bit, but I was always like the last two weeks of the off season, I always be like, I can't do anything. Like I, cause everything I do is like long-term. It always is. Uh, so, uh, but this year I was like, I'm excited for baseball, like fully. There's no mixed feelings. It's like, uh, yet I, I will get a mix when I miss the game, I think, but, but at least right now, like my excitement for spring training. Now I, I, I get it. I get like the, the people in media who were like, let's go. It's baseball. Season. Like, I feel the same way. I, I totally understand where that came from. So I'm really excited to talk about it. I'm really excited to get going because, uh, there's like the sky's the limit. It's just new. It's just like, it's like joining a new team or like just getting drafted. Like that's that excitement I, I'm feeling right now. Do you feel anything missing like physically? Like I should be throwing, like I should be ramping up, like I should be running, I should be out in the sun with the guys? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's something I'm going to have to become very, very uh, cognizant of. And, and every single guy who's retired, retired has said this, like, dude, you have to like focus on staying in, like in shape if you want to stay. Like it's hard. It's really hard. The motivation's hard when you don't have a job, it being your job. It's just, you think it's going to be easier than it is. It's not easy. So uh, I think that though, I'm going to, if I turn it into like a, a project that that'll, there's something to track. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be fine. Uh, that, that works for me well. So I'm not super worried about it, but yeah, I, we have a, we have a big like turf complex close to our house, some two big, really turf fields and ever like there's like 50 to a hundred kids out there every afternoon. Uh, when we go, my wife and I go for a walk by the place and, and they're all like playing, there's lots of baseball players and there's lots of soccer players, lacrosse players, but I'm just like, yeah, I miss kind of running around. I kind of want to get going. But I think when summer comes around, then it'll be easier. Well, you sure. were talking about getting excited. You understand like the the media excitement now, now being on the mm -hmm. outside, uh, looking in on baseball. What plans do you have? Because you're you're kind of in the media now a little bit, making some YouTube videos again, getting on Twitch and, and being just involved in talking about baseball all the time. Oh, so many things. Uh Another thing came across my desk today. So I'm to, to the point now where I'm like, ah, you know, people are going to get sick of me 
Uh, we don't want to, we don't want, we don't want to be in front of everybody all the time to where they're just so like, everything I'm saying is just repeated from the thing I was on yesterday. Uh, so uh, there, I had to think about that, but, uh, yeah, I have, I have the rates and barrels pod with, you know, Saris, um, on Fridays, which is going to be like, you know, I, I don't, I don't really want to like, you know, cross or, or shout out another podcast on a podcast, but we love, love know, that podcast. Know, shout them out all the time. <laughs> Eno, Eno's a, like, you, you know, Eno's a, yeah. uh, just, uh, just brilliant when it comes to the numbers and things. And I, me, me and him have had these combos for years now. Just every time I would see him, we'd just get into the, the weeds on like the new pitch that everyone's throwing and like things we're talking about in the bullpen. And so now we just get to do it officially. So that's going to be Fridays. I'm not certain. We haven't, um, I haven't gotten clarification on exactly the time it'll be released, but it's recorded on Friday. So it'll probably be Friday or, or Saturday. I'm assuming Friday right after the show uh, is our best shot. So, uh, look out for that. Um, I'm still doing Sirius XM every Sunday with Danny Wexman uh, from one to four Eastern time hot stove, which is just, we're not, we're kind of making it our own and I think we're getting and going there. So that's a lot of fun. Um, I have, uh, you know, my own uh, podcast. Uh, I have another kind of show, maybe a just solo, a solo sh show that I'm, I'm developing, but I don't know how that's going to work. So look for that maybe later in the summer. And then there's a possibility that I, I do some stuff with the, with the ten, twins local uh, uh, station as well, um, and that would be like Mondays possibly, but we don't, we don't, we're not quite there yet. And I'll be making guest appearances on foul territory. I'll be making guest appearances on all kinds of stuff, um, and just kind of trying to bring my own like flavor to uh, to the shows. And so I'll be around. You'll see me. But those are the big ones. Uh, I think rates and barrels is going to be a whole bunch of fun. We've done a practice episode, and it was. Like it's, it's going to be good. I can, I can say that. Yeah. Busy guy at rates and barrels is the baseball podcast. I was like in my rotation besides messed up. Like that is the one like, Eno is mm -hmm. like the writer that like got me into pitching like years ago when he was with fan graphs and really dove into that. How'd you, how'd you build that relationship with him? Was it from the A's last year? Uh, no, no, actually, uh, we, every time we come into Oakland, um, we just get chatting about pitching and, and I historically have like made pretty drastic adjustments in my career and he's a guy who notices that so he'd always notice like when did you start doing this um because it's usually like a night and day difference uh i'd have like really good uh success with a pitch that i didn't have previously uh he was interested in the splitter in, in 2022 and then he talked to him after i got injured he's like were you injured because you're splitter now i'm really interested in how splitters affect people's arms i was like yes you're right right on and i told him that i'm like i i didn't go about it the right way and so then we had a long conversation about that um i also my locker was next to scherzer for that series and Sch him and scherzer are just scherzer's great i, I whenever he talks you know because Eno's really really smart but again he's not a player and that's a big box you need to check with max when you when you make it he just is he, he just values that very highly the experience and so you know, uh, always cordial, but like you could tell you can, you can get him. He's getting riled up a little bit, but you know, so I'd always sit there and watch them. And then I talked to, you know, after which, which, which was always good. So we run into each other. And then when he realized that I'm, I'll go and I'll like get in the weeds about stuff, maybe give him more information than other guys would give me. He, he, he would seek me out when he was around. And then last year he was just around a lot. So, um, we got to talk about sweepers and like what we were trying to do and how we're, how like all the guys on the team throw sweepers and like, why and where's that coming from and was that a coach so he was it just kind of made sense and then they approached me right away right away um and uh and yeah that's kind of how it happened but we're very similar in a lot of ways i, I think and um i'm kind of like hosting i'm kind of the i'm kind of the mc of this one nice which that's yeah. the only show i'm doing that with even my own show uh that we do where we talk about like rewatching we go rewatch movies i'm a film i'm a kind of a cinephile at, at this moment and that's my fun one um, I'm not even the host of that. So it's funny. <laughs> the only one, the only one that he I'm hosting is like, they brought me on like, Hey, you're going to host, right? You're going to introduce us and you know, take us out. And I was like, well, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I know I could do it. I just wasn't anticipating it. So it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be great. That, uh, that perception you talked about with between Max and Eno, as far as like, you know, has the knowledge and like so much of this information is now publicly available. Things like baseball savant Brooks, like People have their own stuff models everywhere, their grades and everything. Like we can all see that now. And that's something I think Mark and I, a lot of other baseball content people use. Is that something that kind of has looked somewhat down upon inside of locker rooms, especially as pitchers, that there's a lot of numbers and spreadsheets being thrown around without any game experience whatsoever? 
yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you, you know, guys are getting their ego poked a little bit. Uh, and that's just as competitors, like when someone maybe is saying you're not as good as you think you are at certain things and, and, uh, you know, they're giving evidence for that stuff. You, you, you go, whoa, 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 but you've never, you don't know what it's like, you know, and that's logical, I think, but it's mostly that. And, and it's funny if you really pressed a guy, they'd be like, I don't really care that much. Like, yeah. you know, they can say whatever they want. Um, it's, it's kind of the same vein. Like sometimes players aren't huge fans of like their team's commentators, but they, the commentators aren't for us. Like it's when true. we're playing yeah. poorly, they're supposed to be with the fans. Like they're not supposed to be with us. So yeah. if they're constantly like holding water for us, that's just not going to be a very fun thing to, to like, if you're frustrated as a fan, you don't want to hear the guys like defending the players. You're mad at like, just be mad with us. Right. <laughs> just support us. See us. Uh, and so, you know, that's, it's like one of those things. You just got to learn it. Like, where are they coming from? Like, yeah. what's the benefit of saying it? Like, it's no, nothing personal. Um, and uh, so, yeah, some of that comes up, but also some of it's like guys like refute the conclusions. Uh, yeah. I think Max is smart enough, ma smart enough. Max is very, <laughs> enough. Uh, that was not the right words. Uh, Max we're, knows we're, we're a lot that. of <laughs> Max, <laughs> Max knows a lot about like he, uh, analytics too. He's divine, designed like he's like 15 reports he looks at. Like it's not like he doesn't look at numbers. Uh, it's just very specific to him. And um, he, he, he's, he, he's got his personality, man. He's got, he, he'd tell you, he's like, I'm, I'm a little stubborn too. And that's just part of who I am. So I'm going to defend some stuff to the death that most people wouldn't. Uh, so that combination comes off a little bit like you're an idiot but like he's not saying that and uh, it's just the way he is it's just he's intense he's just an intense dude so yeah it's 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 a mixed bag but most people just don't care um but like i've had days where i'm like uh yeah my projected stats are always better than my real stats but like i'm just close to you know lining them up like just give me just give me be patient with me and it really never happened until my last year but uh sometimes it's just yeah you just want people to love you I mean, throughout your career, you've hopped around from the Twins, the Mets, the A's. How much of like an analytical shift, I guess, have you seen from the start of your career to when it ended? Like how much more are those numbers and and different, you know, algorithms and stuff being used day to day? Yeah, it's incredible, actually. Since 2014, there was nothing, especially in Minnesota. And, and I would say Minnesota was a little slower, too. Uh, but even then, like 2014, like even the Rays weren't the Rays yet. Uh, uh, the Astros weren't the Astros yet. They were just terrible. So like the, uh, that the guy, the teams that are leading that charge, the Dodgers were probably first, um, mostly like because of the, they just took some chances and, uh, getting new personnel in there. And, and then, but like when we got the Josh Cox and the kind of like all these outside of baseball people brought in to be like head of analytics people. And then the, that's when people started building out like, I need this, I need this, I need another person for this. And that's when, that's when we saw departments getting built out. When that happened, that's when it took off. Um, my big, my big revel or like revelations were in seventeen. I was in Tommy John, so I spent a lot of time sitting back with the analytics guys. Uh, and Hefner was one of the head guys uh, with the Twins at the time. He was he was back in the back room, and so we hit it off. Where you know I played against him. Like you know, we're almost he's three years older than me, four years older than me. So, and now he's wearing my number. I don't know if you knew that he's number sixty five now. Yep, for the Mets, which is <laughs> yeah. so cool. I'm like, I know you chose it. He acted like he was just giving it. To, uh, Kevin Kears gave it to him, but <laughs> we know he chose it. Uh, but yeah, so we 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 hit it off, and then that's when he like he's like high heaters, man, high heaters. So I came off the IL from from Tommy John the next year. That's what I focused on. That really kind of started to make me into me. So uh, I noticed it mostly in 17, 18. Uh, it was happening a little bit before that. I think 16 was probably the year where it was really getting going. Um, and uh yeah it's just been crazy since now everyone's just now it's an arms race it's always going to be an arms race what's the new big pitch what's the what's the new hitting philosophy you know are we looking for homers are we looking for you know what how are the rules going to change things and you got to be really agile with with making those changes in your philosophy because the teams that do it the fastest are the best what was it like being with hefner for two different organizations and even with that like we've seen the mets regimes change multiple times since hefner came to the club a few years ago is that is that how Maybe like how rare is that for a coach to stick along through different types of front offices and different types of general managers, different types of even managers? And what does he do that makes him someone that has become indispensable and has to stay around? Um, well, the guys like him uh, who are who are, who make are really good at making adjustments and and pivoting uh, are rare. There's there's not that many in the league even now. Like as it goes to uh, pitching coaches, a lot of them have kind of their thing. 
and uh, like their their philosophy that works. And when their personnel starts to not line up with that, they're not as good at coaching them. And that's natural. That makes sense. Um, he's kind of a he's just a sponge. Like he's always like reading up on you know like a lot of like what you know guys like you say, are saying like guys uh, you know g- doing the research and the guys at fan graphs like he's he's aware of a lot of these uh things and then he tries to translate it into on the like how can it be used on the on the field and he's always talking to other pitching coaches that he's known that are doing like the the the, the third party stuff or like working go work for driveline or whatever uh pitch designing and um so he talks to those people too so he's just like he, he he searches for information because he knows it could be the way they approach pitching could be completely different year after year. That is going to keep your job. Um, that and I think that you know you guys know the the Mets uh, were were very much in flex there for about a decade uh, to different GM every two years. Uh, <laughs> and I think that Stern is a guy who has a track record that that, that like this could be the one. Uh, he's also from there and he understands what it's like. You know, I, I know that's what you wanted. I, <laughs> yeah. want, I want that for you guys too, because you've got forever. the owner now who's going nowhere, who's going to keep trying. Yeah. You want the GM that that him they they they're connected and have that philosophy locked in. Um, and then I think Hef's a guy who can work with, like at least from the pitching side, continue to uh, develop the philosophy to fit. And I think they see that in him too. I, you talk to if you ever talk to him, like you just get that vibe. And uh, I tremendous respect for Hef. I think he's extremely intelligent. And uh, also just like honest and like, hey, man, I don't know. Or, hey, man, they just like that's just not happening. Like like there's been times where I've been frustrated about stuff and he just was like, hey, like you're really riled up about it, but it's really not going that way. Like it's not happening like you think it is. And I I respected that, too. So he'll tell you how it is. And uh, he's he's honest. One thing I'm really excited for and I hope you are, too. I cannot wait for him to get his hands on Fuji. Yeah. Um, oh, my oh God. we're so excited oh. over here. We've, We've him and I have had back and forth or like I gave him I gave him the lowdown um because I think Fuji's crew that he's bringing with him, they're awesome. Oh my yeah. god, I love those guys. <laughs> oh yeah, you him played and, with and, him. his yeah, interpreter okay. and his trainer, dude. They're the best. So <laughs> I was gonna um, say crew. Who's the crew? <laughs> it, you know, that yeah. every Japanese player has has two two basically uh two staff members for them. Um Issei and uh uh Kino and Kino is magic hands so like everyone wants to <laughs> everyone wants to see kino but we all have to make sure that you got fuji first you got is he good are you guys good you got time cool kino me and you uh he was my guy so uh mets get them too which is great but uh fuji's a sponge too so they're both like i you just just wait spring training you're gonna see lots of fuji isei and half sitting talking a lot a lot a lot a lot i mean we've been talking about fuji on this podcast all off season james has been like this is one of the guys that you can just like mold and turn into something that could be special. Let's hear from a former player's perspective. What what makes Fuji so exciting as a, as a reliever or someone that the Mets you know are now going to have to fix or whatever it's whatever that is. His uh, his ceiling is uh, higher than everybody else. Um, so one thing you got to know about him is he's he is a in terms of his pitches in a vacuum. He's one of those guys who, who like, they're not, none of them are like crazy. Like it's not, he has not a crazy sinker. He doesn't have a crazy riding fastball. He's kind of got something in the middle, but he throws a hundred, he can throw 103 miles an hour. So like a lot of people talk about Durant. He's the same way when he throws four seams, they're not great four seams, but he throws 102. They, you can get away with that. Um, so, uh, but Jake doesn't, Jake DeGrom doesn't either. So like, it's all about how they work together. So he, he has the stuff. And it's always there. He's a freak athlete. He's so strong. Um, he does the work. He's he maintains his body. He's, he's he's always throwing that hard too. He never has a down day. So and then he has a splitter. He has a true out pitch. So he has a true out pitch, and he can throw over a hundred miles. Not a hundred, over a hundred. He could be the top three hardest guys throwing guys in the league. So um, you know, I don't know if you knew this, but Edwin Diaz also doesn't in a vacuum have an incredible slider or a fastball either. It's just how they work together. And so Fuji's the same way if he can figure that out and throw the fastball and pick a spot, throw the splitter off of it, and just he's he's Japanese, so that he also throws a curveball and a slider and a sweeper and a <laughs> you know he throws a sinker and a changeup and a you know he throws all the pitches. Um, he's he he, but he was just like kind of overloaded, I think. And getting the simple, that's half's good at that. So like, I think that's a big thing for him. But it's gonna be it's just gonna be that and and then executing because he's gonna have days where he's just all over the place. It's gonna happen at first. It is. And there's going to be a confidence that has to build 
And so just try to be as patient with him as possible. There's probably going to be a blow up somewhere. It's probably going to happen. He's not infallible, but in terms of stuff, if he dials it in and locks it in, I just he's one of those guys where no team wants no team's like, yeah, bring Fuji in. Like they don't want that. <laughs> Nobody wants that. And the reason he had a seven last year is because he like gave up like 45 runs his first 30 innings as a starter. And then he was a reliever for last year. Like you're just not gonna get the lowest you can get your ERA at that point is an eight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you could throw a scoreless for the rest of the year and you're still in an eight so he kind of threw that out the window and he kind of threw really really he threw like a what three one or three two after starting in his first year in the big leagues i remember i had a conversation once one day in the bullpen i said hey we're talking about tunneling i'm like do you know what are you familiar with tunneling he's like they we have that in japan that's what he said yeah. i go where are you trying to throw your fastball like if you had to if i gave you you know one thousand dollars said pick a fastball spot where would you throw it and he, he just thought, and he goes, uh, down middle. And I said, Fuji, that is the, never throw it there, ever. <laughs> never aim for that spot ever. And that was just like throw a strike. Like that's kind of where his head was at. Like I need to throw it over the plate. And I'm like, down middle in the major leagues is what every single person on the planet wants. They all want that, especially when they, you throw that hard. So I go, maybe if you aim up and then throw your splitter and just throw your splitter, up, try to throw it up too, and it's going to go down. Just throw those two things. We had Shea Langliers do this only. And it, it was and then it was just he was Fuji after that. So I'm not taking credit. <laughs> but you're taking uh, but you're taking a little credit. A little we, credit. Had that, we had that we had that conversation one day. I was just like, think of it as a tunnel. You just pick one spot and then throw your two pitches to that one spot and then move from there. And you'll get you'll throw more strikes, you'll get ahead more, and you'll feel better about it. Because I had done that too for the because of the clock. I had to keep it simpler. And so it worked for me. And he's like, oh, and then you know, there were a couple of days where he was like walked to three guys and like, didn't really have it. Right. But the other days he was striking everybody out. So it's like better than what it was. Um, so he's, I think they're going to build on that too. I, I think that I told Hef that I'm, uh, and he was, like, Oh, he, yeah. Okay. Like, cause we've had that. He's like, Oh, we're, we're having that conversation. I, we got this. This is going to be awesome. We're going to, they're going to have a lot of fun. So, uh, I have, I have high hopes for him and he's also just, just the best guy. So, uh, you always want the best from him. He's you're in good hands there. He's just a he's a sweetheart. He's a good dude, man. He's and they all are. Issei and and Kino are just awesome too. So I'm really happy for the Mets. So at the All Star break when he has a three two ERA and thirty five percent strikeout rate, it's gonna be ninety percent half ten percent Trevor May on the credits. Yeah, let's just yeah, yeah just keep my name in there somewhere. Okay, uh, yeah. I just need that credit really because I can't play anymore and I just need it, please. Funny, one thing we were going to ask you was one Mets pitcher who was like a sleeper, someone you had higher expectations for. But I think you just answered that organically, which is cool. But mm -hmm. do you have general expectations for this Mets team this year? I feel like there's this division among fans right now where people think that we're punting, where people are not excited because the roster doesn't look as pretty and spectacular as it did the last two years. But there's a lot of good depth there, a lot of things being done. So as now a member of the media, as someone who's outside looking in for the first time, what are the expectations for one of the 30 teams? I would say, um, you know, would they have a term that we, we've been talking about on the radio that the Red Sox throw out, and it's the bridge year, um, because the Mets are definitely one of those teams, too. There's no full rebuilds. Like, the, the amount of money you have, you don't have to full rebuild. But sometimes there's a little bit of a, you know, let's take our foot off the gas pedal for a minute. And having Stearns come in, that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like you're smart to do that because if you keep trying to, like, throw things against walls – it puts a lot of pressure on, you know, that philosophy. Like he wants to bring in his philosophy. Say what you want about it, right? In Milwaukee, they were consistently producing so good. like close to at max capacity. He's good at yes. that. He's good at getting the most out of what they have. And if you look at just talent on paper, like they shouldn't have been first and second every single year. No. Like, Hell you no. know, and so it, it's a good division, like with the division with the Cubs and the Cardinals in it all the time, like to be there, it's, that says something. Um, so put money into it, but he's not going to be like, Hey, give me $500 million now either right away. That's just not how he operates. So getting a year of him to operate, there's might be a little patience there that, but like a Mania pickup, uh, uh, like, you know, Bader, like there's a lot of really good pieces. They're all guys who've been really good at one point or another. It's just maybe some of them are reclamation projects. So the difference, the thing could be like how many of those things pan out. That's it. Like, does Otto do 2022? Because if he does, now you have an eighth inning guy. Uh, it just Jake Diekman keep the walks down a little bit and not give up any hits. Now, you, now we have prime Jake Diekman because he throws hard still. He still throws 95, 96. Uh, like, 
the stuff's there. It's, these guys have the same stuff. It's just how is it going to play out? So if they do those things, though, now it goes from a team that's like, oh, we're just kind of competing to, oh, we're like, we're there. We're right there. Because you still have Lindor. You still have Nimmo. You still have McNeil. You still have Alonzo. Like, you have the core. And then you have Alvarez, who's like your, you know, your catcher now. And he, if he gets better, he can hit. So, like, that's five really good hitters. So, you know, that's a that's enough to score runs. It's just how is it going to pan out? Um, and it's just about execution at that point. So the talent's there. Uh, I, I like a lot of the pickups. I think there's tons of depth, tons of guys that can do a good job. It's just are the stars stars? And uh, and then, honestly, the starting pitching. It's just, you know, what's Tyler going to do? Um, what's Peterson going to do? Like, what, 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 are, what do their years look like? One of those guys go off, though. If we have an old McGill or a, a Peter Sapiti from a couple years ago, uh, then Sanga's going to do Sanga things. So, uh, and then Mania come, bounces back. Like, see, see how there's a lot of that. Uh, so it really depends. But I think that the potential is is just as good as anybody else in the division. Uh, even the Phillies. Uh, uh, even even the Phillies. And, I mean, the Braves are the Braves. It's, it's hard to root against. Yeah. Not root against. I can root against them all day. <laughs> yes. But yes. it's hard to <laughs> see. They need a lot of stuff to happen for them to get less talented as a group. Of course. Right? Yeah. They have to lose a lot of guys for them to be a less talented team. Great um, seasons. But they're beatable. Like, they're beatable. And... Uh, you know, anything can happen. So um, I think the talent wise, if everyone's cooking, though, they're just as good as any other team. So uh, it's just there's just more question marks than normal. Yeah, it does feel great to hear you say that, because I mean, me and James, we've we've been saying it all off season. Same thing. It's like keep the expectations low for this team, but don't be surprised if they play much better than you expect, just because like you said, the core that is on this Mets team is really good. And like, you know, Pete Lindor, Nimmo, those guys are gonna be locked yeah. in for what they do every single year. You mentioned Alvarez. You got to spend a little time with him at the end of 2022 when he got that call up. Mm-hmm. Everybody has just glowing reviews on this kid and that, you know, he's he's a special player. And even last year with like Scherzer and Verlander talking about pitching to him, they love throwing to him. What did you notice with Alvarez in that in that time at the end of 2022 that kind of seems to be that separating factor between him and a lot of other players? Yeah, crazy, to be honest. I, if, you ha- if you asked me in like 21 21- like the end of 21, if Max Scherzer would be like pumped to throw to <laughs> Alvarez, he wouldn't be. I don't think he would be sold because he was very raw and he's a hit. Like he was a hitter first. I think that was something that's something you assume about guys who can hit catchers uh, is that when they're that good at hitting that it, that's probably what they care about the most. You know, the you know, the the Wilson Contreras kind of kind of thing. It's it's no he likes he's a catcher and he takes it seriously, but he definitely likes hitting the most right it's pretty clear he's been it's pretty obvious so there are guys like that who 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 don't put in quite as much work catching uh and that's not the case with him like he it's almost like he knows he knows that's what people think and he doesn't want that um he wants to prove that he's a really good catcher and then he makes good decisions then he can call a good game that he's paying attention and he understands and i got that vibe in 12 22 when i came back off my injury and he caught me in triple a i was like oh wow shrink uh the pitching coach there time was uh i think he might still be i don't, I don't know he might be um but he, he just like let francisco do it i sat in too i i, I didn't need to be there but i was like i want to i want to see how francisco runs this and he was you know he struggled a little bit with you know uh, the language at times and and things but like he was it really engaged in in how are we gonna attack this team and that was triple a and triple a it's really easy to be like whatever just call, put the fingers down throw them uh you got like 35 year olds, like your whole staff, 35, they don't care. Right? So it's really easy to be that way. And he took it very seriously. So that, that surprised me just a little bit, but seeing how hard he was working at the catching part. And then last year, just like night and day, even talent wise, I was just like, what he's, he's like becoming one of the better defensive catchers in the major leagues in his first year. I did not see that coming. I was like, if he's average at catching win, cause he can hit. Um, but he's proving to be better than that. That's, that's ex- that's it's exciting, man. Uh, who wouldn't want to have like a JT Real Muto t- type? Who wouldn't want that? That's I think that he's the most. He's so valuable. People don't understand how valuable that is. Being able to hit like that, catch like that, and and like honestly, I'll, Frank Francisco can run a little bit too, like better than most. Uh, he's athletic and he can do things that most catchers can't. So I'd be excited for him. But really getting an endorsement from Verlander and Scherzer, like uh, what else you need? I mean, now if I'm a free agent, like I feel like I'm covered going there. So that's huge. Especially if he was 21 years old the whole season last year, just turned 22 this past winter. Like we see most yeah. catchers 
not even when they come into their own, when they reach the major leagues, here it's 23, 24, 25. Adley came up about 24, 25. He's generational. Cal Raleigh just broke out at 26 years old. The fact that Francisco's putting these things together at in his early 20s, he could barely legally drink. I think that's the most shocking thing. That's insane, yeah. Uh, funny, funny Alvarez story too. This was from 22 in spring training. Um, I think 22 is, a, yeah, it's the first year's big league camp. And, uh, he, you know, he came in, he's wearing his, like his Jordans and, you know, his chain and, and, uh, you know, your first, you're like, we got the rookie who's, you know, <laughs> blinging up coming into the thing. And so you, you, you know, there's assumptions you make, you're like, are we going to have to, you know, are we going to have to like get on him or not? We didn't, it wasn't a problem at all, but we're doing, uh, PFP practice one day, or we're doing like defensive drills and pitchers are supposed to, we're tr- supposed to throw the ball home during the play. And, uh, you know, we just show the ball and be like, Hey, I'm going to throw it. Okay. Uh, so I get up there, we're doing our drill and, uh, Francisco's like back there bucks hitting. <laughs> so I go, I go throw the ball and I go and throw and I, I go as I'm throwing, he's not looking at me. He's like, he's, no <laughs> helmet on. he's not looking. I just, he's crouched though. And he just talking to somebody and just chest just <laughs> and goes to the back and go what? And the buck buck looks at me like, what the, and then just throws the ball up and hits the thing. I go cover. I'm like, I'm like, what are you doing? dude and and i I look back at everybody else i'm like was he look like was that on me they're like no dude he wasn't looking so i like i almost kill our our big prospect catcher because he's not because he doesn't he didn't think i was throwing even though i he just for whatever reason he just wasn't paying attention and then then later that day i'm in getting my arm worked on he comes in he just gets an ice pack put on his chest (laughs) and i'm like are you good i please it's your fault but i still want to hurt you like and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't look, and uh, uh, I didn't know, I didn't know, and uh, that I was like, they pro- they like him more than me, 100. percent Like I would too. I, I'm more excited for him than me, so like I, I don't want to be the guy who hurt him. But that was that's really funny to look back on, and now that he's fine and he's thriving. But yeah, one time I hit Francisco Alvarez in the chest, um, threw a strike though, like that, <laughs> round the money. Yeah, no, you didn't round miss the, the target. He, nope. he was talking a lot about uh, catching Diaz, obviously missing last year. It's going to be a lot of questions, I guess, with him coming back. Uh, having injuries yourself, what's it like that first spring training back after an injury where you, you're just sitting out an entire year? You haven't really pitched. It's uh, it's weird. you got to get back in the swing of things. But honestly, it isn't that much weirder than having the offseason off. You just like forget what it's like. Uh, it, it Going from like not competing or doing anything competitive and then just suddenly competing at, at the highest level in the world is always jarring. Um, but I know sugar pretty well at this point and, uh, not a lot phases him. He's just going to go do what he does. Um, he's going to be rusty. I, I, I think I talked about this on another pod and just like, just expect him to be kind of a little bit like he might have a spring training out in your two where you're like, Ooh, he's all over the place. Cause he has those days. Like he's always had those days. Uh, and so that's going to happen a little bit, but if he gets his slider dialed in just in the strike zone, he'll be fine. Um, I just, I, the thing to pay attention to is making sure he gets, you know, you know, if he's getting like four or five outings in the spring, like he probably needs a little bit more than that. I bet you need seven or eight to be ready for the season. So pay attention to that, how much he's throwing. Um, but if it's no, he's so athletic and he doesn't seem to, I've seen videos of him throwing. He doesn't look like anything's wrong. So he's not even wearing a knee brace. Like he's just going. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if he's just like normal, like, like nothing happened normal because he's, that's the type of athlete he is. Uh, so I, I hope, I hope, that's the way it is, but yeah, just a little patience. It's it's rust is a thing, especially when you're off. It's it's just not easy. He was really vocal at the end of last season that he wanted to come back. Maybe he'd like to prove it to himself, prove it to the fans, prove it to the organization. Maybe just because he just signed that big contract, wanted to get out there. Is there is there something to that when you have a big season injury like that? Even just throwing ten pitches on the mounds before the off season, butterflies or whatever. Yeah, no, there definitely is. Um, well, we had the same thing with Noah. Uh, he was adamant. He's like, he, his, because he had setback after, like, he was just so frustrated. I remember having conversations like, dude, I just need to get an inning. Like, give me two innings. Give me one outing so that I can at least make a case that I can play next year. Like, and he was also going to free agency. That's a big part of it too. But, um, yeah, getting a couple, just finishing the season, showing that you can pitch in big league games, um, sets up an off season and then sets up you going into spring training in a completely different way. Mindset wise. The question marks, like, for example, the team's like, oh, can we, like, can we count on him being ready for, for opening day? Can we? That kind of goes away because he, he threw in a game back then. So that means 
you're healthy for the offseason. But if you go into it and you didn't throw in a game, they're still like, okay, but how close are you really to throwing in the games? Because we don't know because you haven't done it. So um, I get it. And he's just a competitor too. There's part of that too. Um, but I know he's thrown like, what, 600 bullpens since. So like, I think he's going to be fine. Uh, it's just, you know, it's a different speed. But yeah, spring trainings, that's what it's for. So Yeah, no, I mean, like, of course, with Diaz, the, the year that he had in 2022 was just phenomenal, super special what he was able to do, striking out like 50% of the batters he faces, which is just, I mean, that still doesn't really even compute in my head. It feels like a fake number. It feels like video game type stuff. One of the big things, of course, with him was also the trumpets. I want to, what, mm-hmm. what's, a, what's a teammate's perspective? Like, does it hype you guys up too? Because obviously it gets the fan base going, but like as someone Ooh, in the bullpen, it. are you like just amped up when you start hearing those trumpets going? Oh yeah, I, um, there's. I think there's a little bit of video of him when he comes out a couple times uh, in 2022, the big days. Like you can see me and out of me and Adovino outside of the little room we're in because we want to watch it. Because like we're done. Like we we got to him and we didn't have to pitch. If we're both still out there, we were like, first of all, we're like oh, our our our, uh, our roles over. So now we don't have to worry about the 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 you know phone ringing. At that point, actually, I was like, I still have to kind of just in case if something bad happens, I'm probably the one. So uh, uh, which never happened, which is awesome. But yeah, it's it's that's my favorite thing about sports uh, or, or about baseball. I think that I think that the walkouts and the program there and like the excitement for players. If you do that really well, it makes a massive difference. A team that does this and it's a little bit biased, but a place that does this extremely well and leans hard is Seattle. They lean in so hard on like that presentation and they have the LED lights. City doesn't. I wish they did. Uh, so you can They're turn coming. them off. If you, yeah, this year. Good. Well, the trumpets with li- like a couple flashes of light, like literally trumpets playing or like notes going or something would be electric. They need that. Um, being able to shut down the lights and bring them back up, huge. So, uh, I but I loved the WWE growing up, WWF at the time. Uh, and their entrances were all I actually really cared about. I knew it was fake. didn't really care who won, but I did care when like you weren't expecting someone to show up and they did undertaker like, yeah, the, the, boom, the boom, bells go. And it was go incredible. And, 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 you know, Kane, when he, the, he came out and like, you know, stone cold, Steve, like all of them, like DDP I, was my favorite. I had a bowling ball of D like, I loved it. So, uh, we're entertainers, so you should take that seriously. Um, there's a lot of guys who like do the four different walkout songs, and they're different all the time. And sometimes it's showing, you know, it's 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 showing guys off, showing out guys, rappers you know, or something. Uh, I know Stro does that sometimes. Uh, so I think that you should you get yours, get your thing you're noticed for. Look at look at like I know Phillies. I don't like to bring up Phillies, but the Bryson Stott thing when everyone's singing the song, oh, that's, oh, that's super the cool though. I, I understand I was a- the song. But you yeah, guys yeah, probably hate the song. Fan. That's the point. Yeah. You hate yeah. it. And yeah. you know about it. There's something you associate with Bryson Stott. Like, 100%. like that's cool. Both sides. It's cool. You're like, uh, and then and the fans are like, ah, like, that's what it's about, I think. And, uh, you know, you got the, uh, getting you guys involved, getting the, the people in the stands involved in like that kind of way is the coolest thing ever. And as a player, like, I, it's probably so cool for him just to have like that thing. Like I, I wish I always I've always tried to get that thing. I got it actually a little bit in Oakland to where at least my coaches and stuff were always singing my walkout, which which was cool. They didn't know what the words were, which is they kept saying kitties in the jungle, which is not what it is. Uh, but uh, I got it a little bit with fans. Fans had to ask me what the song was and all kind of stuff. So that was cool. It's what I've always wanted. So I think more people should do it. I, I, I think everyone should do it. I think every reliever should have it. The firemen should have fireman stuff. Like it should be, it should be really leaned in on because I think that's the type of uh, that's the type of thing people want to see at the park, whether they know it or not. Felix Batista had one of my favorite ones the last Ooh, few years yeah. as well. Just being so in Baltimore and them do, doing the LED strobe and then playing the sounds from the wire, where it's like Omar coming and you hear like the little whistle. You're like, this yeah. is local. This is scary because he's a very scary relief pitcher. Yeah. Like everything fits really well. He's so and, big coming out of the you know. It's so funny too because he shows no emotion, so it's like none. Same with Dur- Duran too. He can, yeah. is cool too. I mean, oh, yeah. I'm going to be I honest. Love, he can choose him. a better song, in my opinion. But the fire. So Glenn Perkins had the fire too when I came when I was there. Uh, a little bit a different Johnny than Cash. Duran. Yeah, but the, it like light behind the behind the uh, home plate and then then go like the ring of fire. Yeah, I got it's cool too. 
and then it's perk like doing his like jog out like, <laughs> he's one of the best slash worst jogs to the mound in history uh so but i i was like yes i want this and then no other reliever had anything in minnesota until like 2019 which i had to i had to lobby i was like a lobbyist like having meetings trying to convince people uh not kidding and uh eventually got it done. so uh, i love it my favorite thing I know Bednar in Pittsburgh has a really good one too. It's a classic rock. I can't remember right now, but it's really hype. And he's like, he's a local guy. So the fans have really taken to him the last few years. And I also know yeah. just from talking to him that he's like, took like a, like a leadership role in that bullpen. Like he got the whole team shirts. Like he was branding their bullpen. He was like, where the guys is we're going to be. Is there, is there like bullpen hierarchy like that for the closer to kind of be the yes. leader, the ring leader, the emotional leader in a bullpen? Yes. Uh, that's a real thing. Um, it's not always the closer. Uh, it, you know, a lot of it is uh, tenure as well. You know, Bednar's now been there probably the longest in that bullpen, and he is the closer too. So it just happens to be that way. Like I was the most senior guy on the team on the whole team, and so that and then I be, I was the closer, and there's, we just had a lot of inexperience in our bullpen. So that just naturally fell to me, and I, I tried to take it in stride. Um, you know, and and uh, like I, I know that a guy that I'm going to go to the the fan fest for the A's, uh, Grant Balfour is going to be there. He's the same way. He like, he like led, like that was there. Th he was like, this is our, you know, this is our mindset. This is how we approach games, all of us. And I will, you will follow my lead. And he came out the master of puppets, which is just sick. So and he was, he was, he was insane yelling. on the mountain to scream at people. Like he was, he was absolutely electric. That's so when Australian. the A's, like when the A's were good and like obviously the fan base was showing up for good reason because they were performing well. What was it like playing it there last year though? Because there was just so much going on. And then the Vegas rumors and the the fact that I mean, everybody knows that like the ownership really doesn't seem to care much about the product on the field too often. Like, what was it like to be a part of that last season? It it was a mixed bag. Um, there were a lot of like there's a lot of freedom associated with that stuff. So we, like, we didn't have to worry so much about like guys didn't have to feel the pressure of like winning yet. Like there, there is a little bit, there's when there's no expectations, you have a, there's a, that's a little bit of a weight off your shoulder. I felt it too. So like, you know, when the, when no one expects anything, you can, you can, you know, anything you do that's good is noticed, uh, which is good. Um, but one thing I did feel for was, you know, lack of leadership at the very top, which it is, it, that is lack of leadership. Um, I, the guy doesn't even act like he owns the team. We don't even know. It's like he doesn't acknowledge that people work below him, uh, which is weird. Um, and uh, the people who do work below him, who are supposed to try to make the team better, like don't know what to do. Like there's only so much they can do. There's It's very limited. Like these are things that I don't need to go to him for, you know, <laughs> Uh, green light or not like we stay in that realm because getting like going to him was hard like no one talks to him so uh it, it's just like it was a lot very it could be very distracting and i feel for the i feel for the staff i feel for david forrest and 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 if i seen the 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 gms like they they were they they were i felt like they had their, i don't know for certain but i felt like they had their hands tied quite a bit and and that i just you know it's hard to like you, criticize or even like analyze anyone's perf like performance for in their job if you don't know what extenuating circumstances they are operating under so i noticed a bunch of that stuff that is very me to notice players didn't uh but yeah there's a lot of like what are we what do we do here like a lot of a lot of this looking around and what do we what should we do in this situation how should we handle this with media fortunately we only had like Four media members in there at any given time. And they were very kind about it too. They knew we couldn't do anything about it. So they didn't like, they're like, me asking you and getting you riled up about this isn't going to do anything because you don't know and I don't know. No one knows. That's kind of the point. So um, we didn't have to deal with it too much either. Kotze did. And he was, he was just the face of the team. It was his bobblehead day. He's the one who gave the, gave the, the bottle of wine to Miggy. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> you know, like, like, it's just, you know, he, he, it's not, he's not, you know, he, he knows yeah. he's aware, he's aware, he's very aware. He knows, and he did his best and they all do their best. And so that was hard for me because I care about him and I liked them um, as people and uh, especially the players too. The young guys were like, where am I going to live next year? Where am I? Like, I hate that. I can't imagine what that's like for them. So uh, it's still an ongoing situation, but it, it yeah, it sucked. Uh, it sucked to not talk about baseball, but it also allowed us to do cool things like 
show up on the boycott days and do you know do interesting things and then converse with fans where they were like hey guys we know it's not your fault all of the fans all of them all the signs were like players staff we love you yeah of course like and that problem. was <laughs> yeah, yeah that was that awareness and that like understanding just went meant the world to us especially me so because you know some players like i don't want to like engage because i think that i'm being lumped in with this decision and they weren't so we still felt love from the fans and that was that was really nice this, this might be a bit of a stupid question but what was the vibe like no being and knowing you were the highest paid player in a locker room last year with the a's it was uh weird at first um but uh not gonna lie it was pretty great uh <laughs> <laughs> i went from you know i went from playing with all those guys to being like yeah. the 16th highest paid guy play on the team and all of that i was like I'd, I'd just gotten eight plus years and i was like 11th in service time on the mets so uh i was just kind of a one of the grunts and then you kind of become <laughs> one of the guys who who is being leaned on to produce a little bit more i've always kind of wanted that i felt like i could thrive in that situation um you know struggle with it at the beginning and then once once it got uh really accepted and leaned into then um I uh, I rose to I rose to an, a level in my at least to my own standards uh, that I always knew that was there that I could play at um, and uh, it was I think that that kind of role in the team kind of tells you like you know it's up to you man and when I get back to the corner like that I, I tend to be successful so um, I am I'm proud of that but it was it was a lot of fun I got to be the guy on the mic in the front of the bus my seat was my seat like nice like I, I could and i could be like hey no don't don't do that or give me that or whatever and everyone had to yeah. do it was, no one could tell me what to do i didn't have to run like yeah. everyone ran all the relievers <laughs> ran and i just walked in every day except for the days where they are strength coordinator you know cuffy josh cuffy remember the name he he knows what he did he would sometimes make us run before we threw so that i had to run uh, not that he'll he'll deny that to the to the last day like that it was for me because that, that's kind of it probably wasn't but it did have that effect and there were days where i was like i'm gonna throw this ladder into the stands and make you go get it uh, <laughs> if you make me do this again but uh, uh it was all in good fun um but yeah yeah it was it was awesome <laughs> it was awesome yeah and i mean it kind of all culminated too and at the towards the end of the season uh last thing talking about the a's here was when they did the reverse boycott they they packed the stadium and you got the save you got the last outs in the game um and you you went nuts like you went crazy what was that moment like was it just like nice to have the fans back in the stands and to have them be excited about something in what has been kind of just a really disappointing team and organization in general yeah there was it was all that like at the end of the day we do want to play in front of that kind of electricity no matter why no matter what the reason is um and the players were like we we know what they're saying but the message isn't for us so the least we could do is it was like our way of participating without like having to take this you know we, it's not like we were like taking the stand like we're with you like even though i was it's pretty clear at that point but um but like we're everyone was like hey let's give them like let's give it to them like you know, they're here, they're doing the thing. They're not, you know, I understand they can't do this all. They're not going to do this all the time. And we also understand why, um, because it's just kind of playing into the, the guys, you know, motivations. Um, but we will send a couple messages this year and this is the way we're going to do it. And that's their power to, that's their prerogative. And, um, so it was nice to kind of like see what we can rise to. And, uh, there was two of them actually one. And the one was the seventh win of the, our winning streak when we went from 12 and 50 to 19 and 50 um and then uh one another one was later and i got the same both of them um and lost my mind for both of them so it was uh really really awesome that i got i got to do that a lot like i gotta save on my birthday i gotta save in a bunch of cra like momentous times um and it was uh th things i'll never forget it was so fun just kind of knowing where we were at and we just believed that we we're gonna win because they were behind us and that was that was a blast that was really cool it was fun those nights too where it's like this is a loyal fan base that deserves a winning ball club every fan base does but they're one that's been there forever seen success and saw that their whole team get kind of torn down in their eyes so it was really nice that oh, you just feel like like the belief and you said before like you guys are entertainers like that's kind of the whole whole thing here but yeah last 10 minutes here I want to bring it back to some Mets talk talk about the fact that things you like to do YouTube videos you made one a couple days ago that I think Mark and I both found pretty interesting about uh the Billy Upper situation for the people that might not know or be aware that 
Billy Epler is being kind of, I think technically it's like soft spended for the entire 2024 season for what's being called an injured list manipulation. Is this something that you think that Billy Epner is acting on alone? Or is this something that kind of, he might be, he, it might be something that he's being picked out for. Um, I had a little bit of a both. Um, it's a little bit nuanced, I think, because just my experience, like the way this stuff happens is the guy goes into the training room, starts to ask some questions, gets checked out for things. And then the, then the training staff tries to figure out kind of glean from, you know, cause a lot of that guys aren't just gonna be like, Hey, my knees hurt. I need to go on the IL. You nobody does that. Uh, you gotta be like 10 years in like Max Scherzer coming back. Ah, oblique again. I've had this 58 times. I know what this is. Let's, let's, you know, let's start the wheels turning on the rehab. Right. Um, but younger guys are like, I want to, don't want to go on the IL cause then I'll lose my job. So, um, they have those conversations and then that's when the manager and the GM and like assistant, GM, like everybody in that group kind of like, okay, so what do we, are we going IL? How are we, so we could do this quickly. So if we get a guy from AAA, we can like get them on a flight first thing in the morning, as opposed to having to figure out for in the morning, especially if they're, that team is in wherever, like they could be far away. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of logistics. So that speed is important. So this happens a lot. Everyone's privy to the, the decisions being made. The interesting thing. And the thing that I mentioned on the radio, not in the video was uh, the advent of the COVID IL and the, the gray area associated with the COVID IL and testing and what needs, what can be considered stick, what's just sickness, what's COVID sickness, and like how do we, uh, you know, define those things. And I'll be honest, it was a little bit confusing sometimes um, and around the league. And so uh, I, don't, I don't actually know anything. I don't really know much about how that was handled, but that just is something that, historically hasn't been there and only has been there the last few years so it wouldn't surprise me if if that was involved somehow because it's hard to verify without uh, uh testing and all that kind of stuff it, it, like and testing wasn't required as much anymore so like what do you do um uh like when how many sometimes guys don't have negative tests for like a month but like they they haven't been contagious for 22 days they can't have that. So how do we make the decisions? And a lot of times it was literally case by case. You'd ask the MOB or whatever. Like you had to do that stuff. It happened with me. Like it took a while. And then we're like, they're like, you know what? We're, we're, we're good. And then, then I had a negative test like right that day. So it worked out, but like it was taking a while and we were worried about it. <laughs> so uh, all of that, that, that to be said, um, I, I, I don't, that's just not, it's, it can't be just him, but like knowing Billy, he would just say, Hey, at the end of the day, I'm the one signing the paper. So like, just because I'm like, hey, what sh is he going to go on the aisle? And then they're like, they're like, yes. And he's like, okay. And he signs it. Like, there's a lot of that. And, but that's understandable. Everyone, do every team does that. There's a, it's, it's, sometimes it's close, but can we get, a, you know, are we good? Are we good with a 10 day here? Can we get away with it? Can, can we handle a 10 day here? Um, and is he going to be okay in 10 days? <laughs> is this like, uh, so like, there's a lot of that. Uh, the fabrication thing was the weird word for me because that insinuates that there's nothing and we're making it up completely. And that's hard. There's even if there's a little bit of verification or not much, there's still some very rarely. Can you put someone in the aisle and have no reason? Yeah. Unless you're, and, and unless you're blatantly like forging a document, which seems so obvious that like, that's going to get caught. Um, but again, usually that's, I mentioned in the video, it's mutually beneficial. So the weird thing for me is why was this reported? Like what, who, it's kind of where we're at too. <laughs> whoever reported it, why do you feel the compulsion? Because yeah. technically, if you like, it's the only other thing who would be harmed technically would, is the reason it's a rule is you're going to get advantage over another team pretty clear that didn't happen <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, and it rarely does i mean teams that like try to like have a lot of uh transactions aren't the best teams yeah typically. they're not <laughs> you don't want to do this like you don't want to do this you're just trying to hang on um so it, it rarely is harmful to other teams in the league so to to kind of come out like this crazy thing was happening it's not your crazy thing yeah it's probably not uh done the right way but to to the whistle blow it the way it was done just uh, there's something missing i'm missing something relationship wise uh with the person or it wouldn't surprise me one bit if someone just didn't like billy like 
or whatever. I don't know. I, I don't know. I really don't. I don't really have any information either, but like just having been there for two years, um, like that's just the only thing it could kind of be something, something like that, which then now we're not talking about what happened. And now we're talking about why we're talking about it. So that's, that's kind of my, uh, my take, but I don't, I don't see me getting any more information. I don't think I'm ever going to know. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think we are either. I mean, it, like not, to, not to you know keep hammering at home. Um, but I think this is probably like the last denser question before we just get into the, the viewer questions. Cause they, mm-hmm. they've been itching to ask you a couple over on Twitter, but with the Mets this off season, some Mets fans would say they missed on some free agents, not getting Otani, not getting Yamamoto, no, whatever it's going to be, whoever that Met fan is that thinks that they missed on these guys. What's the perception of players of New York City playing for the Mets? Is is there any negative connotation? Or is it just like some guys are like, listen, New York City's not for me. I'm not going there. Um, you know, again, that's pretty nuanced too. I can be on I can tell you one thing though. Um, the uh the term Mets it. Or, or that's so Mets or, uh, uh, you know, uh, lol Mets or whatever. Yeah. Is a key, players are aware. They're that's, aware of that. That's, and they, that's hard to hear. They use that term <laughs> sometimes too, because, you know, again, like it's, they follow bar, bar stool or, yeah, yeah. you know, and, you know, for, we talked about on another show. I love for, I love as a person, but there is a certain connotation that if that is the, the the takes you are taking on that team, you're going to think a certain way. It's just the way it is. If that's where you're getting information, uh, he knows that. So everyone knows that. Um, so sometimes, yeah, there's a there is a like it, it's per, portrayed in a way that is uh, uh, interesting, is is, is kind of hard to decipher as a player who's never played there. So then then your next thing is to talk to players. So I get it like I've asked I've been asked this. I asked this. Based, I was asked this by one of the free agents to sign there and they said, is it really like, so they've heard <laughs> and then I'm like, dude, no, like, like you're going to, you're going to meet some media guys who you're like, I'm probably not going to be as open with you as I might be with somebody <laughs> else. You know, it's, it's Yankees, same thing, Philly, same thing, Boston, same thing. There are like four or five people. Who you're like, you're going to get more canned answers probably from me because I don't trust that you're not going to try to spin it. Um, and that's, that exists in huge markets. It's just LA's got some, not as many, but some, uh, because that's the way you get noticed when you write stuff. So it is it, it, like, it is what it is to an extent. Like here's a prime example. And I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, this is not a, a, a commentary on the, 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 uh, media member or, or even the, 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 the network, but there was a quote tweeted by the movie or by the tv network about something that stern said the other day and do you are you aware of what i'm talking about uh it was uh it was about pete alonzo and like yes. i think that's the most likely oh, outcome yeah. that he yep. goes to free agency and i and i watched the video i'm like actually that's not exactly what he said <laughs> no and i know it's sl- a slight different in semantics but the the insinuation changes dramatically when you change the words and so i was like what he said was, "We're probably we're probably not going to have the conversation towards the end of the year. Not he's going to free agency, and that's most likely. That's yeah. not what he said. You kind of skipped a step here, but everyone who commented on it was just now we're having a conversation about what the, what the title says and not what he said. And so now I'm like, well, <laughs> now what? Now everyone just thinks that, and that's not exactly what was said. Uh, even if it's not that big of a deal, that stuff compounds a little bit sometimes, and it's hard to." address when everyone thinks you thinks you were saying something that you weren't and uh that's that's hard to navigate sometimes i struggle with it too so um but that doesn't just happen in new york let me be very clear it happens everywhere so it's like do you defend yourself or you just kind of it's not that big of a deal and that's kind of what you have to do now that that piece stuff's been frustrating us too on the inside. That exact quote from that TV network that will remain unnamed. We we also <laughs> made made a meme and quote tweeted it. The classic one of the little kid with the trumpet and the little girl like covering her ears because it's like, how can you ask the same question every single day to this guy and expect to get a different answer? It's painful. Yeah. It's just nauseating. And then when you start to mislead the fans just to generate clicks, now you're like the whole thing we're talking about, you're changing the perception of this organization that you're supposed to be supporting. And now that yeah. we have some proof that that is 
again, not just from you, like right now. Now we have proof from Trevor May that this, that's not what we're doing here either. <laughs> but it's just like I heard Matt Olson on a podcast last year saying like we were really excited to beat the Mets because of that Barstool employee or because of a, a bald guy who works for Radio Network that sometimes Mark and I say mean things about where it's like when these people are so <laughs> overconfident. Somehow I know that, who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yes. somehow, somehow it's really <laughs> obvious. Yeah, but it's funny because they're actually two bald guys, but you still know the bald guy we are talking about. I know, but I know you're talking about. The fact that there's this perception around the league where it's like it's more exciting to beat this team because of these these people outside the organization it's like for us to hear that sucks that's awful <laughs> there's there's extra motivation to beat our favorite team like it's painful yeah yeah like yeah it, it's one of those things like yeah it's fine if there's extra like it's not that big of a deal but it does like it has an effect and we, we kind of just don't act like it like what you're saying doesn't matter like yes, i yeah. hear that a lot i hear i hear some people say well you know you should just ignore me i'm a human being not that easy yeah. you ignore me oh you can't <laughs> it's hard so like you know, like then it just ignore when I when I struggle. Then just you ignore me, ignore yeah. my performance. You can't because you know because it's happening and you, what you're saying is happening. So I'm not gonna ignore it. So uh, it's one of those things. Like, but now now we have a, a thing going that doesn't is unnecessary and doesn't really yeah. help or drive drive the drive the story forward at all. So it's not like I don't need everyone to be like, yay, keep going, guys. Like we don't <laughs> yeah, we're not that's that's not the only other option. The only the one thing is just like sometimes benefit out a little bit of hope every once in a while because that's fun too it doesn't always have to be like it doesn't have to be like they're going all the way to and they're the worst team ever like it doesn't have to be those two things um and sometimes that you know we get very polarized that way because it's helpful for the job that the people that are doing saying that are doing it's helpful for driving numbers which is the world we live in too so i'm empathetic to that as well especially now that's what i do so uh, <laughs> title title um, trevor may says pete alonzo is coming back there it is that's yeah, the that's title what I'm of the like, get the yeah. clicks <laughs> yeah um it, you know who knows at the end of the day that's what stern says stern's like who knows I, yeah who knows but right now it's not happening right now um yeah. and the things that are lining up like based on track record scott boris last year platform year you don't yeah. usually get extensions done with stop or now it just doesn't really happen he doesn't really do it he doesn't even engage so like don't count on this happening right now and that's true that's him being honest and true but he's like i'm not going to answer this question very much anymore and i'm not going to update you on the conversations which i thought was awesome but everyone's like, oh he's so he's so uh what what did they what did i say i saw one that was like he's so uh sure of himself <laughs> I'm like, he just says, yeah, I'm probably not going to fill you in, guys, so I wouldn't yeah. count on it. Maybe maybe that'll help you not ask the same question over again. It won't, Mr. Stearns. They're going to ask you. <laughs> you got a lot answer. more. Got about a so six just, months worth of the questions left. But at the same time, it's like, this is this is it, man. I'm here. Like, you know, it's where he grew up, too. So it's like very part of it, too. I don't know. It's all how you think about it, I guess. Hey, he said he got more shit at Thanksgiving than he gets from the media and Christmas dinner. It's like his, his cousins and his uncles and his family members being like, what are you doing with the team? He's like, I got it under control. And I also love that Mets fans are now like, he's so smug. Like he's an Ivy leaguer. It's like, I do not want an Ivy leaguer to run your <laughs> baseball team. Like what's going on here? That's, yeah, I want do. him running this team. Chris Young, really Princeton, do too. It's, right? So, it's funny. Uh, it's just like, yeah. it's just, it's just how it is. It's just how yeah. it is. It's just the, it's the incentive at the end of the day. Yep. Of course, Trevor, we could probably talk even more baseball with you than we already have, but we want to sneak in a couple couple viewer questions, like we said, from Twitter. This is a Mets, Mets fan legend, Jordan Simpson. He's a musician. He says, uh, for me as a musician, studying pitching mechanics slash pitching videos really helps and inspires me musically. Was there anything non-baseball related that would help slash inspire you with pitching? Cues, mindset, anything? Wow, um, that is a really good question. I feel like there's a lot but nothing is popping into my head. Um, yeah, taking little bits and pieces. Uh, sometimes it's like from other sports, um, how guys, uh, you know, address certain things. I, I, one big thing for me is always, I've always thought about pitching as a simple three-step process where you are basically picking a pitch, focusing it on, and then executing it. That's it. Like you just repeat that over and over again, which makes it seem boring when you do it too many times in a row. But uh, it also makes it very simple for like making adjustments. And then I always applied that same logic to like, what's that in basketball? What is that in football? Like who's making decisions and how they make them. And it came down to, we all make the same decisions, kind of the same order. It's just the amount of time we have to make it. And so that was the big thing. Like I learned from tennis is a great example. Tennis is fast, but you have to, you're like taking information. You're trying to remember what you know about how that, like in what situations, how they, what kind of shots they try to hit on you. Like, how do they lob? When do they lob? When do they backhand? When do they, you know, you're trying to get them to go to one side. You have to remember that stuff, but also react. 
So like pitching is similar in that we have to know what we're trying to do and then throw and react. Like throwing and react is the fast part. The thinking is the is the longest part. Um, and uh, I'm like, well, then how do they do it? And then how do I do it? How can I be quick? Trying to learn things like how can I be, how prepared do I need to be to react quickly? This was big during the during the clock changes. Uh, I would, I looked at tennis and it was, it was really enlightening, read a little bit about it. Um, like Jokic talking about, uh, not Jokic, uh, Jokovic, sorry. Jokic is, uh, a basketball player. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jokovic close. talking about, uh, how he prepares, uh, like what he looks at and what he, what he wants to know about guys. Cause it, it lined up, um, pretty well. So that other sports were a big one. Um, I love the, I love the, uh, the musician side of things too. That's really interesting. Uh, there's a lot of like mental you know, mental approach, like long distance runners, but it's always like athletes or high performers that you would take stuff from. Like, how do you get yourself? How do you do anxiety? How do you like, that was a big topic for me too. So yeah, just a bunch of different sources. And I tried to like aggregate a lot of them and I, I'm always just curious and random stuff anyway. So, um, but yeah, just looking, looking kind of in those areas, other sports was a big one because there's so many parallels. Another question from, uh, Bella long one, probably messed up the biggest fan that exists out there. Being a player for 10 years, does that affect the, like, the way you watch baseball games now at home? I guess it hasn't technically happened yet, but will you, do you think you'll be on the couch with a very different mindset than the average fan or just having taking in the game in a different way? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll, uh, I think I'll thrive the most when I have someone who doesn't know so much. I can teach them about you know what guys are thinking and what they might try to do. Um, I was also saying this on the radio the other day that I'm so excited. My favorite thing. The thing I'm most excited about is uh, predict making predictions. Nice. And just like seeing far, like Tony Romoing it a little yeah. bit and like being like, he's gonna throw this here. Or uh he's gonna try to hit it over here, or they might hit run here, or they might drop a bunt, or I gotta steal in the second pitch because I know like Acuna. A casting when Acuna is gonna steal is gonna be so fun because I think I'm gonna yeah. be, I think it's yeah. gonna be really easy. Um <laughs> Nah. <laughs> He's so good that it doesn't matter if you know or not. So like that kind of stuff. I'm really excited for that stuff. I think that's going to be what my viewing experience is like. Last question here. This comes from Michael Morgan. And uh, you, probably an easy answer for you, but we'll see. Are you done done? Or will you keep your arm in shape in case the team comes calling in August for a veteran's presence? And then he said, we need you, Trev. <laughs> I just saw that. I saw that. I already saw that one on Twitter. Uh, I was going to reply, so I'm glad that we got it here. Uh, no, I'm, 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 or yes, I am done, done. Uh, someone else asked me yesterday, like, if uh, the Mariners offer you a one-year deal, would you come out? I'm like, well, first of all, report day is yesterday, so <laughs> I'm late. Second of all, I retired in October, guys. I didn't leave the door open. It's not like I couldn't yeah. have gotten the job. It was possible that I could have signed if I really tried with the Mariners. I could have been like, hey, I'll take minimum. And they're like, so they would be absolutely so stupid not to yeah. take that. But uh or just give me a shot in spring, right? Minor league deal. Like if I really wanted to, I could have. I just didn't want to. So no. Um, I, I think that I think that I'm gonna enjoy talking about it and creating really interesting content, like going to games and showing different types of stuff and talking about different things. And you know, um, I I hope uh, Netflix calls for season two of the of the you know of the yeah. documentary series because yeah. I'm so excited for that. I'm so glad baseball is getting that, even if it's. Yeah. The Red Sox. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sadly. Um, so yeah, I think that I think that this is just where I want to be. And it's it's pretty clear to me at this point that I, I think that being done is I'm I'm really okay with it. Well, Trevor, as always, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Such a pleasure. Hopefully we'll get you during the season. Maybe uh have some positive things to talk about with the Mets. Maybe they'll be surprising yeah. everybody here. Before we go, let everybody know the listeners, the viewers, where to find you, what's going on. What what you whatever you want to plug, go for it. Yeah, uh, big thing. Uh, Trevor May Baseball on YouTube that is getting uh, the vast majority of my attention. Right after I'm done with this, I got I have a video that I've been working on for a month, and it nice. needs to be done. It Reliever rankings? Be, uh, no, it's bigger. I'm predicting everything from this whole season, so Ooh, nice. where everyone's going to place in their divisions, and then all the solo nice. awards, and then who's going to win the World Series, and all the records, and everything, and all the seeds, and everything. So um, here's some hot takes in there. Please don't get super mad at me. Uh, uh, you know, but I don't think you'd be super surprised with my with my uh, analysis. Very similar to what I gave you on the Mets today uh, yeah. about the question marks, but also a lot of a lot of experience and, and potential. So nothing crazy there, but there might be some other teams who are like, come on, man. So <laughs> but uh, let me know in the comments. Can't wait. And then uh, another thing that I've implemented is my discord channel has kind of 
been split into two. This is uh, discord.gg slash Trevor May. Um, and you can basically come in and I have gaming stuff in there and I have my baseball side of things and you can tell me which one you like the most and you only see that stuff. So if you're into just the baseball, you select baseball when you join and uh, there's all these forums. Each team has their own forum post. Uh, we have some uh, other things that'll be going through the year. So if you want another place to go chat with other people who like baseball, um, that's a good place to do it too. Uh, I'm being more and more active. We have all kinds of fun stuff going too. Like you can earn points and level up and we'll be doing give. I want to do ticket giveaways and things and, um, and being there will be the best place for you to participate in those things through the year. I don't know a lot of that stuff's going to shake out, but a lot of ideas and uh, that's kind of become our community hub. So uh, yeah. And then obviously all the socials. I'm Trevor May everywhere. Awesome. All right, Trevor, once again, thank you so much for coming on and uh, guys, thank you for listening, watching. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Mets up podcast. Peace out. Peace out. See you guys next time.